Welcome Bethel family to our online service this morning. We're so glad you've joined us today. Because of our current situation with the phase one and the things that are going on, we wanted to reach out to you and let you know we'd like to do communion with you if you're comfortable with that. For us to come by your house and we'll have a time of prayer and we'll do communion together since it's the first of May and we normally do communion at the first of the month. So if you want to let us know, give us a call and we'll be glad to come and join you for that. It'll be great fun. So now we're going to get to Pastor's sermon. We're so glad to have him deliver another word from the Lord for us today. And I just pray that this blesses your spirit and that God reaches out and lets you know how much he loves you and that he's with you no matter your circumstances. Thanks for joining this week. As we journey the seven-week series on Pentecost, and today part three is Standing Strong, Building a Strong Foundation. You see, Jesus lays a strong foundation in which we are able to build our lives on, a foundation and a lifestyle of exceedingly above all that we ask or think. Our cornerstone scripture in this series is Ephesians 3.20, and it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be the glory in Christ, by, in, in the church, by Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The past couple of weeks, we have learned the exceedingly abundantly above all lifestyle that God has prepared for us and is calling each one of us to. We have seen how he calls the ordinary people like you and me to a lifestyle of abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. As we move forward in today's message, we will see Jesus is teaching us to live this life that he is calling us to live. Jesus lays out the foundation for a successful and blessed life. Today, we're going to look at the most well-known of all his teachings, the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus begins with the Beatitudes, a list of blessings that follow a very specific way of living and thinking. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12, it said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you are reviled and persecuted you. And say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. So for the persecuted, for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, after Jesus lays out this introduction for Christian living, if you will, he starts on real world issues one at a time, like Believers are the salt and the light. Christ fulfills the law. Murder begins in the heart. Adultery in the heart. Marriage is a sacred and binding. Jesus forbids oaths. Go the second mile. Love your enemies. Do good to please God. The model prayer, fasting is only to be seen by God. Lay up your treasures in heaven. The lamp of the body. You cannot serve God in riches. Don't worry, do not judge, keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. He also tells us that the way is narrow. You will know them by their fruits, and I never knew you. Then he tells us to build on the rock. His final statement to this crowd, who are blown away by his teachings, is the parable of the wise and foolish builder. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27, it says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the wind blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone 
who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, he is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat the house, and it fell in great, the Bible says, Jesus says, great was its fall. Again, Jesus is giving us the foundations in which to build on here. You see, building is, is a great idea. He tells us to go make disciples. So what are we doing in church? We're building a foundation of, of making disciples. And we should understand that when it comes to our Christian life, we should constantly be building, building our faith in him. Our building is not just moment by moment, or it's not just one decision at a time, but it's a multitude of moments and a multitude of decisions that come together into our lives. And you see, Jesus wants to make sure that we're building on a solid and strong foundation. You know, I think of a plumb line. And a plumb line was used to find depth, and it was also de uh, used to determine the vertical on an upright surface. So I love the example of a plumb line because if you're sitting there holding a plumb line by a string, you have a weight at the end, and there's nothing more vertical than that. Even if the floor you're standing on is uneven, you're still going to have that plumb line, that vertical line that's perfect. The plumb line is one of the most powerful things used in the Old Testament. The Old Testament plumb line was used in ancient building tools. God used a plumb line to communicate his plan to Amos and the importance of staying in line with his commands. Listen to Amos chapter 7, verse 7 through 9. It says, Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line which a plumb line in his hand, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people, and I will not pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac shall be desolated, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid to waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. Here God is telling Amos that he is setting a plumb line in the midst of his people. I love that passage because when you think about it, God is displaying the perfect life that he's wanting us to live. And some say that we can't live in perfection, but we can strive as long as we have that plumb line laid out in front of us. Now keep in mind that this passage was over 2,000 years ago. If you go to any construction site today, you'll find somebody using a plumb line. Now, it may not be a string with a weight on the end of it. It may be a digital form of measurement, but I promise you that every builder, every contractor, he's going to lay a strong foundation, and on that foundation, he's going to begin to build walls, and those walls will have plumb lines held to them. And then we see the very similar message in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 17. And it says, <clears throat> and I will make justice the measuring line. Whew. I got to say that again. The prophet Isaiah says, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters will overflow the hiding place. You see, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is like taking a string and stretching it out and tightening it on both ends. And he's saying, here's the line that we must follow. Here's the direction in which we must go. When I look at John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, a thief does not come except to steal, to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Friend, this is what we're talking about this morning, is having life more abundantly. It's what Ephesians says in chapter 3, where he says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that's in him. I want you to keep that in mind as we're talking about the seven weeks leading up to the day of Pentecost. 
So here we have Jesus. He's taken this line, if you will, and he's tightened it. He's like, I want you to hold the line. It's like the, the title of my message is, is building a strong foundation, standing strong. Jesus is wanting us to stand strong on this line because he knows that in this line, we'll live life more abundantly. Now, in the very same scripture of John chapter 10, 10, the Bible also says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. Friend, I am here to tell you there's nothing that the devil wants more to do in your life than to destroy your life. If he can get you to release that line, but just for a moment, Jesus is pleading with you, hang on to the line, stay strong, stand strong, build that strong foundation. He's saying, allow me to build that strong foundation inside of you, friend. There's nothing more important than that right now. You know, a lot of times we get distracted by all the goodies that are in life around us, trying to strive for more of this or more of that or build a bigger house or a better car or a newer car or have fancier clothes. And, you know, all that stuff is good as long as it's in its due place. But if those things become a distraction to make us let go of that line, friend, I promise you they're not worth it. They are not worth it. The devil, he tries to get you to let go of that line. He'll try to bring doubt and discouragement. He'll do whatever he can to destroy you from hanging on to that line. He'll attack your family. He'll attack your marriage. He'll attack your job. He'll do whatever he can. He sees a Christian hanging on to that line, friend, and he's going to come up. He's going to try to get you to let go of that line because there's only one objective that he has. He doesn't want you to spend eternity in the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus says, I have come to give you life more abundantly. And that's what we're talking about today. My first point, hold your commitment to God strong. Friend, hold your commitment to God strong. I've been reading through the book of Revelation at night, and I, I'm listening to the end times, things that are that are coming to us, and, and how death and destruction, and, and I sit there and I think about when Satan and everybody is thrown into the pit of hell forever and eternity. There is nothing in this world worth spending the rest of our life burning forever. There is nothing worth it, friend. Now, I kind of want to keep this lighthearted, but I have to tell you that I believe God is giving us a strong call right now. In the midst of all this isolation, it's time to build our commitment to God strong. We have a lot of time on our hands right now. If you're, if you're like me, you do have a honey-do list that you want to do because there's things that you now have some time to work on around the house. But the most important thing that you have to work on is being the evangelist in your home, being the witness and the testimony of Jesus in your home. Hold on to your commitment to God. Hold on to your commitment to God strong. That plumb line that God has drawn for us. Strengthen your relationship with God through the reading of his word and praying. Place the word in your heart so that when the enemy does come against you with lies and with deceit, you can rise up with that double-edged sword, that word of God, and defeat him in the name of Jesus. My second point is hold your commitment to others strong. Hold your commitment to others strong, friend. Like when you find yourself tempted to get angry or to speak evil against someone. I know that this morning we found out that the whole quarantine was going to go till the 29th, and they made that decision late at night. And friend, I'll tell you what, we got a little angry in our house because we're in phase one and, and we're supposed to start opening the country back up. And it was hard not to get angry at that decision. But listen to what God says and remind yourself what the word of God says. And it says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You see, when we can take and apply that word, we're holding on to that plumb line. When we feel our anger, or our frustration, 
against somebody to speak evil, but we grab a hold of that plumb line and we're reminded of what the Holy Word of God says. And it says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. That's hanging on to that plumb line. Or maybe a little closer home, for example, when you lose someone close to you and you feel like closing yourself off, maybe through death or separation, something happens and and you feel yourself beginning to come get down or or even maybe being shut in your home too long and you're you're feeling like you're starting to kind of close yourself off allow the holy spirit of god to speak through you to you through his word because the bible says blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted for they for you will be comforted when you're mourning holy spirit will come and he'll comfort you when you're feeling like you're wanting to get angry or speak angrily at somebody, remember, the Holy Spirit will be peace in your heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. He'll come and he'll give you peace in your heart. And finally, sharing your testimony with others. Reaching out to someone that God has laid on your heart or just realizing that the people around you, they need Jesus. The ability to share Jesus knowing that you might be rejected. Here is where Jesus tells us about those similar situations where he said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Friend, I know it's difficult, but we as a body have to learn how to share the good news with others. We don't have to have have our Bible in our hand We just have to operate in the greatest gift. And that gift is the gift of love. You see, when we begin to operate in that capacity, that's when we begin to see the exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And I want to encourage you today, friend, that when you see an opportunity to share your testimony or just share the love of Jesus with someone. Listen, there's a lot of people in this city that need Jesus in their hearts. There's a lot of people in this city that need to know that he is the way, the truth, and the light. There's a lot of people in this city that are going to, they're going to be robbed and and destroyed and killed by the enemy if we don't share the good news with them. You see, there's a power inside of you, and we're going to be getting to that. But that power brings that exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or could even think. I'm going to close. And there may be some of you that have joined in and you've been hearing this message and you're saying, you know, I fit that category. I've never accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Or, you know, I know the churches, not Bethel, (laughs) but churches are full of people who go to church to check that, make that mark off their box. They went to church. The prophet Jeremiah talks about them. Jesus even talks about them in the last week of his life. And they go to church just to check that box off, to say, I went to church, I'm a good person. Friend, being a good person doesn't get you to heaven. What gets you to heaven is confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's the key that gets you to heaven. And the other one is to hang on to that plumb line, hang on to that line that the Lord has shown us. You see, when he starts in the Beatitudes, And he begins to say things like, blessed are the poor in spirit. He's telling us how we are to live our lives. He's showing us that line, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This morning, you may be wanting to make a decision, and I want to help you make that decision. The Bible is very clear. We must realize that we are all sinners and all in need of forgiveness. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God saves us. God, uh, excuse me, God gave us a way to be forgiven of our sins. In Romans 5.8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then finally in Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says, confess that Jesus, 
is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. If you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. And friend, if you gave your heart to the Lord this morning, I would love for you to call us at the church. We've got our phone set up to where we can take the phone calls. I would love for you to call us and reach out to us and let us know. I want to close in a word of prayer. Father, we come to you in the precious name of your son, Jesus. And Lord, I ask that you put a hedge of protection around everyone in Bethel. Keep us safe, Lord. Keep us pure, Lord. And Father, I pray, I pray right now that you would bless Bethel. Bless their provision, Lord. Bring in the provision, Lord, during these tough times. God, we're relying on you. You're our provider. And we know that you're our provider. And Lord, I'm asking you to bring the provision in for us at Bethel, for the families of Bethel. You've been so faithful. I've heard some great testimonies. And I just bless you in the name of Jesus. Bethel, I love you guys. I miss you all very much. Tanya and I are ready to get back into church and start having service. We know it's going to be a few more weeks yet, but we're working on some ideas where we can have some corporate fellowship. The other thing is, Miss Tanya talked about having communion. If you're comfortable having communion, we would love to come and partake of communion with you together. Until we hear from you, God bless you. Have a great day. And hang on to that line of Jesus. Amen?